Hey guys, this is Rudy from Palm Beach in Florida. It is Monday, it is October the 17th, and this is part two of uh, a two series video that I'm uh, creating sort of as a little mini documentary. The first one was um, my top five energy positions. And uh, in this particular video, I'm going to share with you my next top five positions. When I say top five positions, I'm talking about money. So as an institutional investor, how much money do I have in which stocks where I basically just buy and hold and sit on these stocks, they foundational stocks for me. And uh, how many of these stocks are sitting in my portfolio, effectively just growing and growing and growing over time. Because remember time in the market is better than trying to time the market. And on all these stocks, so um, the five that I shared with you in the previous video uh, were my top five energy positions. In other words, my largest five positions in energy. And they included Petrobras, Occidental Petroleum, Enbridge, Energy Transfer, and XLE. And on all five of those, I reinvest my dividends. Now, in this video, what I'm going to do is share with you my next five. They're not in order necessarily, but what I'm doing is I'm sharing with you effectively my top 10, right? So this is going to be the next five uh, of my largest positions. Some of the positions that I have in these stocks that I'm going to show you now are actually larger than some of my stocks that I hold in my energy portfolio. And the reason for that is simply time in the market. For some of these equities, I've held them for so long uh, that the value has just compounded over time, especially with reinvested dividends. So it's a little bit of a mixed bag here, but to a degree, uh, there's some much of a muchness in here. So uh, the first one is ICANN Enterprises. Then I have a couple of banks or financial institutions or financial type companies. One is a commercial bank, retail bank, TD, Toronto Dominion Bank. It's a Canadian bank. The other one, Alliance Bernstein, is a New York-based uh, financial services company. Sun Life Financial is an insurance company. And then I have, much like I had with the previous video that I shared with you, one ETF. So uh, in the previous video, I had four equities and one ETF, which was XLE. And here I have another four equities and one ETF, which is VYM. And I'm going to walk you through why I have some of these in my portfolio. And you're going to say, Mr. Oxy, are you crazy? Why would you hold any of these? Well, there are good reasons why I hold them all. Uh, but let's just see how they compare. So I mentioned briefly what they do. ICANN as a conglomerate is almost like an ETF because ICANN, um, not the person, ICANN Enterprises, the master limited partnership, is invested in so many different types of organizations from pharmaceuticals to energy to railroads, et cetera. It's almost like a highly diversified ETF. More about that one in just a second. TD Bank. So TD is uh, familiar to a variety of different people for different reasons. So Canadians will know TD Bank as one of the top five Canadian banks because Canadian has, Canada has five major banks. Uh, most Americans, especially along the East Coast, will know TD Bank, but may not necessarily know that TD stands for Toronto Dominion, which is Canadian. And um, they might be banking at TD, thinking TD is probably someone's initial. What's well, Toronto Dominion Bank? TD actually has a larger footprint of branches and clients in the United States than it has in Canada, which is not too difficult to do because the United States has a population approximately 10 times the size of Canada. Alliance Bernstein is a financial services company. It's an investment house. So they've taken a pounding because the assets under, of, uh, assets under management uh, has not only been declining, but so have the returns, right? So because the market has pulled back. So from an Alliance Bernstein point of view, everything just gets smaller and smaller and smaller as the market pulls back. However, uh, Alliance Bernstein also sells research. So almost like uh, think of a morning star or something like that as a comparison. They have a team of researchers who sell research to a number of different clients. Life insurance company, so this my insurer here, Sun Life, is actually also a Canadian corporation, um, are kind of steady eddy. You know, you can just, uh, it's almost like LED light bulbs. You can just uh, plug them in, set them, and forget them. Uh, you don't have to worry too much, much about it. The last thing that people do is uh, cancel or withdraw their insurance. So it's kind of like a money printing machine. It's just slow, steady eddy. It's kind of like, um, almost like Warren Buffett owning Coca-Cola. It's kind of like owning Sun Life. It just kind of putter, putters along and pays you a nice dividend and that's that. And VYM, the ETF, this gives me a little bit of risk mitigation when the market is very, very volatile. And I'll preempt this by just uh, sharing with you that as the market um, 
pulls back. And as the market becomes more and more volatile, um, I also shrink the number of positions that I hold. So, uh, you know, sort of a typical bull market when the market is just running and everybody looks like a superhero and super smart because of their investment choices, but actually it's just because it's a bull market. Uh, I might have more positions and I might also take um, more risk on some smaller cap stocks and uh, take a chance on some uh, stocks that I wouldn't otherwise necessarily hold. Now do the reverse when the market becomes very volatile and we go into bearish territory or it becomes a recessionary. Then I contract my positions. I actually have less positions so that I can more tightly control it and sort of stay up to date with where I'm at and what it is that I'm doing as I'm making my investment decisions. So BYM is an ETF, gives me a little bit of uh, sort of risk mitigation and market coverage. I'll get back to that one in a minute. Now you could say right from the bat, uh, right off the bat here, you could say uh, all five of these stocks suck. Um, five of them are fi- uh, three of the five are financial stocks, and they've pulled back. ICANN is kind of just sort of hung in there, uh, but just a few months ago, ICANN was at sixty nine dollars, and now it's at like at fifty bucks. So even that one's taken a bit of a pounding. And of course, VYM being reflective of the entire market is just a dog anyway, because the market is down twenty percent, so VYM is automatically down about twenty percent. Much like I did on the previous one, I'm looking here at the technicals and uh, looking for anomalies or, or things that are sort of out of the ordinary. So a couple of changes here. A month ago, everybody um, and their dog said, sell ICANN, and now 24% of people are saying, buy it. The reverse is true on Alliance Bernstein. Only 40% of people a month ago said, sell it. Now everybody says, sell it. Same with Sun Life, right? So I'm looking at these going like, okay, what's the market sentiment to look like on, on one of these? Um, when you look at the 20-day raw stochastic score, uh, we know now um, when it's over 80, it's uh, somewhat overbought. So uh, people are getting back into uh, into ICANN, and the rest of them uh, not so much. So uh, there's there's opportunity there, but let's look at it in a, with a little bit more detail. How's the performance been? So you can see ICANN's actually been holding its own over the last six months. It's only down. 1%, effectively, it's flat because remember, this thing pays a dividend of almost 15%. And then uh, the financials have just been slaughtered, right? So down 20, 30%. And um, VYM is down 13%. So now you might say, uh, Mr. Oxy, if you are down uh, you know, 27% in a position, why are you still holding on to the position? Well, the fact of the matter is, if you look at a stock like, for instance, TD Bank, I have been in TD Bank. Uh, since around, uh, where are we now? It's 2022. I've been in, in uh, TD Bank since about 2008. Uh, at the time of the financial crisis, I bought in at a low price and I've been reinvesting my dividends and adding to my position as we uh, go along. So um, my actual uh, cost basis is low enough for me to say 27%, 28%, 30% is nothing uh, as long as you spend time in the market, because like I said in the previous video, time in the market is better than trying to time the market. So much like I did on the previous slide, I'm looking here at the annual sales of the company and then comparing that to its market cap. So what we have here is uh, ICANN doing approximately $11 billion in sales with a market cap of 17. So uh, when you take these um, numbers as a fraction, it's an interesting little picture because we have TD and Alliance Bernstein. By the way, you can't really uh, rank or rate a bank in the same way that you can rate any equities because banks work in a little bit of a different manner. Uh, but it's still, you know, it's an interesting little snapshot. You have a company that does $38 billion in sales um, and it has a market cap of uh, $111 billion. Uh, Alliance Bernstein does $416 million in sales his market cap is 3.2 billion. So it's a huge um, difference there or delta between the um, annual sales and the market cap of the company, which is not the case for ICANN. In fact, its sales are kind of close to um, the uh, market cap. And look at Sun Life, right? There's 28 billion in sales. It's only uh, got a market cap of 24 billion right now. So uh, not everything is always as it seems. That's why it's very important for you to do, do your due diligence, do some of the uh, exercises that I'm doing now and then decide what's cheap and what's not. These stocks are all relatively cheap. So even v- VYM, the ETF, has got a uh, PE ratio of only 15, which means it's probably a buy right now. But look at the rest, eights, right? And um, the highest e- the uh, PE ratio here is TD Bank at only nine. 
So these stocks are actually super cheap right now. Should you buy them? I don't know. Why don't you tell me? Look at the uh, performance over the last nine months, so basically year to date, and you can see that uh, all of them are negative. To be fair, uh, ICANN is kind of flat. The rest of them, the financial stocks have just taken a pounding, but we're going to look at them a little bit more in a little bit more detail. My worst performer by far has been Alliance Bernstein, which is down 36% so far this year. Let's look at them individually quickly. So it's, there's just five of them, so it's not going to take too long. You can buy ICANN for about 50 bucks. It's sitting right in the middle of its 52-week range, which is 47 to 58. So just over a year ago, earlier on, I said a few months ago, it's actually just over a year ago, ICANN was in the high 60s and now trading at $52. In the middle of the 52-week range, eh, you know, based on that metric alone, not a bad time to, uh, to actually get into ICANN and scoop up a little bit of the stock at 50 bucks a share. The annual dividend, $8 per share. $8 per share based on the current stock price is yielding 15.2%. Um, that's a great dividend. It's a fantastic hedge against a declining or volatile market. And uh, if you do what I do, which is to reinvest your dividends, if you have the ability to do so, it compounds super quick. It just grows and grows and grows. I've said this many times before, if you can grow your portfolio by 15% per year, it will double every five years. In this particular example, I'm generating 15% in return on investment just on the dividend alone. So if I can go from $50 to $60, I have that plus the dividend of 15%. How about TD Bank? You can buy it for 61 bucks. This was last Friday. So I think TD is up about 3% today because today is obviously a great trading day. But look where it's sitting, way to the left of its 52 week range. It's 52 week low, it's $57. It's pretty close at 61 bucks or thereabouts. It's cheap, the PE ratio around 10, cheap. It's not a small company, this is a major bank. $110 billion in market cap. And look, even though uh, the financials have been declining, this uh, float that's uh, short currently is only 1.8% uh, of the total outstanding float. Lions Bernstein, what a beaut. So this one at $32, I mean, this one, uh, I'm almost confident enough. <laughs> I hate to tell people to buy stocks because uh, inevitably I'm just going to get it wrong. Um, and uh, I don't want to make a suggestion. You just do your own diligent, due diligence and uh, find out for yourself. But Lions Bernstein is super cheap at $32. Uh, on its 52-week range, it's sitting right at the bottom. It's 52-week low, $31.31. .31. It's just a dollar off that. PE ratio of nine. Uh, this one could uh, experience a little bit more hurt, you know, as we go uh, sort of in this uh, recessionary, are we in it, are we not kind of climate? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, but look at the nice edge that it creates for you here because it pays a dividend of $3.79 per share, which at the current stock price of around 32 bucks is yielding 11%. Lions Bernstein, my worst performer, by the way, you can double check me on this because I'm not sure because I haven't uh, updated myself. I took this slide on Friday at the end of the day, more or less. Nah, actually, I took it in fr on Friday evening, October 14th, 7 p.m., so it closed at 32.45 on Friday. I think Alliance Bernstein was up like five or six percent today. Uh, so uh, before you tease me too much about uh, picking an absolute dog, I just remember I made uh, you know five or six percent return on equity today, uh, return on my investment today in one day on a mega mega position in my portfolio. If you don't like Alliance Bernstein, there are other things that you can buy that are similar to Alliance Bernstein, which by the way is has a four star rating. Uh, from Morningstar as of September 23rd. It has a fair value estimate of around $44. So there's a bit of an uptick there for what it's worth, analyst, analyst. If you don't want to buy Alliance Bernstein because it's too small and you want something bigger that gives you a little bit more of a better foundation for your portfolio, buy BlackRock. BlackRock owns almost everything in uh, like stocks of everything on the entire planet. You can currently buy for about 600 bucks and Morningstar's fair value on that is 850. So, uh, hey, you know what? If Alliance Bernstein or one of these smaller investment houses is scary, go with BlackRock and uh, help yourself sleep at night. Sun Life, you can buy 40 bucks. Look where it's sitting. And it's 52 week low. It's 52 week low is $38 basically, and it's currently at $39. So, just a buck above. PE ratio of only eight and a half. Dividend $2.13 on a $39 stock is yielding more than 5% per year. Remember, trying to make 15% minimum. 
right? So uh, if I uh, earn a dividend of um, you know five percent, and uh, Sun Life moves up another you know ten percent, which is four bucks from uh, thirty nine dollars to forty four or so, uh, there's my fifteen. At fifteen percent, I'm doubling every five years. What about this ETF? Now, why do I hold this? I mentioned it's risk mitigation, right? The market is super volatile. I'm contracting my positions and I want to park some money into uh, sort of steady eddy companies, uh, strong uh, business model, uh, good moat, right? For those people who follow the uh, sort of Warren Buffett philosophy of only buy a company with a big, strong moat. Um, that includes most of these stocks that are held by BYM. If we look at the top 10, J&J, Exxon, JP Morgan, Procter & Gamble, Chevron. So I'm actually buying more energy, Exxon and Chevron, Home Depot, Pfizer. Ugh, I don't like Pfizer, but anyway, it's part of DYM. Um, Eli Lilly, Coca-Cola, PepsiCo. You know, so uh, a nice mixed bag of uh, stuff included in VYM. You can buy it for $100 a share. It costs you almost nothing. 0 0.06 is its uh, expense ratio. Does it pay a dividend? Oh, yes, it does. $3.22, which at about $100 stock is yielding approximately 3.3 on an annualized basis. And BYM, as the market has pulled back about 20, 25%, almost 30% now, depending on where you look and what you're looking at, uh, is sitting way to the left of its 52-week range. Uh, its low was $54, and uh, sorry, $94, and now it's trading at 97. So you could probably uh, park some money there and much like my example that I used for uh, XLE, what I'm doing here is I'm saying I need to mitigate risk because the market is very volatile and the market uh, is potentially reflective of the recessionary climate that we are in, where people are paying more for food and more for gas. And the CPI, according to the government's official uh, stats in the United States, is about 8.3%. Uh, 8.3% is garbage. It's more like 25, 30% if you ask the average man in the street. The um, uh, discretionary income that's available is shrinking as a result of people paying higher prices for stuff, stuff that we consume every day. And so as a result, what I want to do is I want to shrink my portfolio, not in terms of value, but in terms of um, sort of 10 easy to manage foundational stocks. I can still play on the side a little bit and I've got Several other stocks that I didn't mention in these two videos, I, I did briefly mention in my energy video that I also have, for example, some uh, uranium stocks, including small caps. Uh, there's a little bit of play money. I, you know, in other words, I still keep myself busy doing that because, hey, if nothing else, it's entertaining. I uh, also have some other larger energy stocks like Benbina Pipelines, which is a Canadian corporation as well. And then... In the sort of diversified other side of my portfolio, on the other side of the ledger, I hold stocks like these. And you will know if you've been following me that, for instance, last year, which is not long ago, nine months ago, up until uh, sort of the end of 2021, the two best performing sectors were energy and finance or financials, right? So if you were in energy and financial financials, you had a huge uh, uptick in your um, assets under management or your portfolio value. And now that it's pulled back a bit, eh, it's not too bad. Yeah? Remember, I said time in the market beats timing the market any day, right? Most of these stocks I've just shared with you, with the exception of uh, maybe VYM, where I initiated the position maybe about two years ago or so, the others I've had in my portfolio forever, right? It feels like forever, certainly a decade or so. Uh, you can't go wrong with some of these stocks. You can just hold them. Uh, like I said, with the LED light bulb, right? Set it and forget it. Uh, don't worry about it. Everything will be fine. Uh, I'm not saying everything's going to be fine in terms of your portfolio, but I do want to add this just in closing. If you are uncomfortable with the stock market pulling back 20%, 30%, 40%, whatever, then you should also be uncomfortable when the market is going up 20%, 30%, 40%, because neither of those two things are linear and uh, are predictable. Nobody can tell you what the market is going to do tomorrow. So you need to uh, decide what your risk tolerance is and what your objectives are over what time period. Almost every single equity that I look at adding, either as a new position in my portfolio or adding two over time as I hold that position, even reinvesting my dividends, is always based for me on a three to five year plan. 
I always say to myself, if I were to exit this position before three years, I probably don't want to be in it at all, right? That's my narrative. That's my investment thesis. And that's kind of how my brain works when I look at these stocks to hold. So what I've done in these two parts is I've shared with you 10 stocks that are foundational to me and stocks that make up my portfolio. And these 10 stocks don't move much at all. I don't trade in and out of these positions. If anything, I just buy a little bit more, even if it's just reinvested dividends. Five energy stocks, right? So I shared the five energy stocks that I hold with you in the previous video. So I'm not gonna discuss them again. And in this particular video, five other stocks. I have more financial stocks and I have more stocks that are related to some of the positions in this portfolio that I'm showing you now, but I'm basically sharing with you 10 stocks that I can just hold, set it and forget it. I can sleep at night, not too worried. It's part of my risk mitigation strategy. And that's what I wanted to share with you in these two videos that I just uh, published most recently. Uh, I hope it's useful, at least to somebody. On that note, this is Rudy signing off, saying thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.